And we are live at the Walter Bosley channel. It's Wednesday once again, time for a live stream. And I'm uh, looking forward to today's topic. Um, so let's see who's in the live chat. There's Marshall. Hello, Marshall, Johnny Side, and Ari Babel. So I'm sure more people are going to be uh, jumping in as we go along. Now, today, I am talking about um, a couple of books that are near and dear to the experience I had with my mentor. And um, these are considered the, I, I, I think, the, the first epic, the first story, the first what we would call novel, I guess, um, in Western literature. By some academic scholars, it's considered that. Uh, it's dated generally to the 8th century BC. And of course, I'm talking about the epic by Homer, the Iliad and the Odyssey. Now, uh, let me um, do something here. There we go. Bigger on screen. Now, these are, um, as you can see, they did some really cool stuff with the cover art there. Uh, what am I doing here? There we go. You get the idea. Um, the editions that I used for years um, were the, uh, the ones, one had a black cover, one had a dark reddish color, and um, the print was smaller because the books were each about half the number of pages as this was. But th th these are better because they've got this fantastic cover art, this edition here, these editions. And these are the ones you want. should be like that because chronologically the, Ili the Iliad comes first and then the Odyssey. Many of you have either read these stories in school, or at least they were discussed in school, um, or you've seen the various movies. Kirk Douglas did the version called Ulysses, and Armand Asante was in a pretty well done television version, um, The Odyssey. Uh, and um, this story has inspired other stories throughout literary history. But we're going to jump in uh, because what I'm going to be sharing with you today is how I was taught to read these books within the context of, um, I guess you'd call it esoteric and occult mentoring. So let me take a sip of the ice water and get started. Now, the Iliad is the story of the Trojan War. Basically, in a nutshell, what matters for our discussion is that the Trojan War, we are told, kicks off because the wife of Menelaus, Helen, uh, who's a little bit younger than him, um, runs off with Prince Paris of Troy. They have this big whirlwind affair, and she runs off with him, and uh, he brings her back to, you know, his home city-state. And this kicks off a massive war, wherein Menelaus um, enlists his brother's aid to raise an army and go besiege Troy to get his wife back. Now, Menelaus' brother, of course, is the legendary Agamemnon. Okay, excellently portrayed, by the way, by Sean Connery in the film The Time Bandits. Well, the war goes on for nine years. Uh, back and forth, the, uh, the Achaeans, also referred to as the Danaeans, spelled just like the tu uh, Tuatha de Danann, how, how I pronounce it, the Danans. Uh, so that's an interesting angle that I've got to uh, dive in deeper on. Well, they they cannot breach the walls. They can't get through the gate. There's um, 
kind of a stalemate, you could say. It's the endless war. It goes on and on. And I'm going to have more to say about the, um, the, the metaphor and symbology of all that. The story opens, the Iliad opens with uh, the great demigod, Achilles, the great warrior, whose father was a mortal, big, strong man, and mother was a goddess. And uh, he's really the big hero, so to speak, the big man uh, in the army that has been pulled together by Agamemnon. Now, what Agamemnon did was he went out through the land, which we know is Greece, but the Mycenae and all that, um, and recruited, uh, you know, got a bunch of kings to raise their individual armies and go off with him and his brother Menelaus to siege Troy, to get Helen back. And Achilles is, you know, one of these who was game, was along for the ride, for the war and such. And um, what happens is Agamemnon shows his true colors, and he decides to take Achilles' war trophies and uh, uh, spoils for his own, primarily Briseis, this beautiful young girl. And this essentially pisses off Achilles for the last time with Agamemnon. And uh, Agamemnon is duly, you know, his typical self about it. He's, he's a, Agamemnon's an asshole, okay, um, for the context here, for our discussion. And he tells Achilles that he's not about to give any of his spoils, the treasure, or the girl Briseis back. And even when the girl's father comes to Agamemnon and, you know, begs him to give her up, uh, you know, to he'll pay ransom and all that, Agamemnon basically tells him to get lost. Well, our story begins with Achilles. He's fed up. He's done. So he's, um, he's stopped fighting. He's not going to fight anymore. He's going to let Agamemnon and Menelaus fight their own battle, their own war. And of course, that means that um, the stalemate ensues and, you know, Agamemnon knows that he needs Achilles uh, leading the battle in order to get anywhere. But Achilles has had enough of Agamemnon's crap is essentially what's going on with the beginning of this. Now, eventually, Agamemnon's best friend, Patroclus, um, will die later in the story. I don't want to give too many spoilers away, but come on, it's an ancient tale. Um, and that gets Achilles roused up again. Because um, he's really, really pissed off about that. So you have Odysseus and Diomedes and all these, you know, lesser kings throughout the land that have um, basically agreed to follow Agamemnon and Menelaus to go retrieve Menelaus's errant wife. And after they've been doing this for nine years, they're getting really weary. And what it comes down to is that a bunch of men are dying and are away from their homes for, you know, almost a decade because one guy, you know, can't keep his wife, essentially. So, you know, you can imagine the cynicism. A lot of them are fed up with Agamemnon. It's like, tell your brother to go get another wife or to, you know, go fight Hector on his own or, or Paris on his own to get his wife back. Uh, you know, who, who wants to die for that reason? I wouldn't. There's no way in hell. If somebody came knocking on my door, you know, one of my old colleagues and said, Hey, we need you back in the fray. We want you to go, you know, far from home and you could die. And uh, basically, we just got to go get this guy's wife who's having an affair and wanted to run off from him. We, we got to go get her back. I say, no, thank you. Go piss up a rope. I'm not risking my life and being away from my home and loved ones for, you know, some guy's drama, you know, but uh, that's really what it comes down to now. It could be argued that there were other reasons, right? But within this context, this is what we're told. So this is what we got to go. The point is of being given this story of Helen is Homer, 
the storyteller, the storyteller, the narrator is trying to um, uh, demonstrate that this war was over something stupid. Okay, it was over a personal slight. It, it, it was not worthy of raising armies, you know, against each other for years and years and years, right? So the Iliad, you know, within the context of the Homer story, represents the endless, meaningless war, eventually meaningless war. I argue in the case of, you know, Helen starting it, meaningless from the get go. No way. You know, I, I, it, the thing to do when your wife runs off on you, let the other guy have her. <laughs> Same with, you know, women. If your husband runs off from you, let the other gal have him. You know, that's the best way to handle that. But no, no, no. Menelaus, you know, his pride was involved in ancient kings and all that stuff. So, you know, it's, it's the pointless war that goes on and on. And... um it is a metaphor, I think, for wars, especially in our times. Some scholars have um, looked at the Vietnam War as like the Trojan War, you know, just going on and on with no foreseeable uh, conclusion to it. It just goes on and on. But I think even more so than Vietnam, uh, you really could apply the Iliad as metaphor for Afghanistan or Iraq, right? I mean, my God, these wars went on for twice as long as the, the Trojan War. So you, you get the point. You, you've, you've got this, this, this whole conflict that these guys want to go home. They're tired of it. And then when Agamemnon does what he does to Achilles, I mean, if Agamemnon is going to walk right in and take the spoils of war, um, from Achilles, who could kill every one of them and can certainly slaughter Agamemnon if he wanted to, well, then he'll take the spoils of anybody else. There's even a point where um, uh, at some point in the story, when Achilles decides, okay, he's got to get back into the fight for his own reasons. And um, he goes to Agamemnon and before the army, he says, look, we need to bury the hatchet, let bygones be bygones, he actually says. And, um, you, you know, he's willing to be the better man, even though he was slighted, okay, and make this overture to Agamemnon. Agamemnon comes out like a, a, a typical narcissist. Oh, you know, it wasn't my fault. It wasn't, it, it, you know, I... Uh, I'm the king. I'm I'm the the number one king. I'm the guy in charge. You can't blame me. Um, and Homer even talks about voices in the army in the crowd crying out, "It's your fault. It's all your fault, Agamemnon." So even you know the guys in the army, they're sick of this shit. They're they're weary. They're tired of it. You know, their their colleagues, their friends, their brothers. Many of them have been killed again. So that some guy can go get his wife back from her lover boy. I mean, it's, wow, you know. Um, but of course, uh, Achilles gets gets back into the fray and um, fights Hector. That leads to ultimately um, Odysseus and Diomedes coming up with the Trojan horse. You guys know the story of the Trojan horse, where they're able to trick the Trojans into thinking they've given up. And, and here's a, um, a memorial, a testimonial to our respect for you, the big giant wooden horse, right? And of course, the soldiers are inside of it. And you know the rest of the story. They get inside and they open the gates and the invaders and Troy falls and, and so forth. But uh, there's, some, there's some excerpts that I'd like to share with you just because the richness of this story is so cool. So let's go to um, let me find here. Uh, here we have Achilles. Okay, now this is early in the story. 
uh, and this is just a sample to give you an idea of how rich this story is and in the conflicts that I've just kind of thrown out there. Achille, this is Achilles um, confronting Agamemnon over stealing his spoils of war, including the beautiful Briseis, who Achilles had a soft spot in his heart for. Achilles scowled at him, Agamemnon, and said, Ha! Greedy heart, shamelessness, and royal dress, how can any man be willing to obey you, whether on some errand or in the battlefield? I cared nothing about the Trojans when I came here to fight. They had done nothing to me, never lifted my cattle or horses either, never destroyed my fruit or my harvest in Phythia. Too many hills and forests between us and roaring seas. No, it was you I came for, shameless man, to give you pleasure, to revenge Menelaus, and you too, dog face. He calls Agamemnon dog face. I love that. For the Trojans wrong. You don't trouble about that. You care nothing for that. And now you threaten to rob me of my prize, which I worked hard to get, which the army gave me. I never get a prize equal to yours if our men capture some town, but most of the hard fighting is done by my hands. Only when sharing time comes, you get most of the good things, and I have a scrap to comfort me. Not much, but all I can get, as I come back tired out with fighting. Now I will just go home to Phythia, since it is much better to take ship and go, and I don't think I shall fill my hold with riches if I stay here despised. Now, I, I want to mention something. Um... He talks about the Trojans had never done him a wrong, right? They'd never stolen anything of his. They'd never, they'd never committed a slight against him, but off he went to war because Agamemnon has a beef with him. Now, um, this kind of hints at what I have come to think of the Iliad and what it's one of the things that it's actually about. And I will, I will get to that. A war on people who really hadn't done anyone wrong. It, it, now, Paris did run off with Helen, but you know it wasn't like Hector and Priam the king and all the family were telling him to do it. Okay, Paris is just a, a rash young man, and, and uh, Helen is you know the wishy-washy woman in this case. Um, now, to Achilles' statements that I just read there, King Agamemnon answers, do go if that's what you want. Go by all means. I do not sink on my knees and beg you to stay for my sake. I have others in plenty who will honor me. First and foremost, Zeus. I hate you more than any prince on earth, for you are always quarreling and fighting. If you are such a mighty man, God gave you that, I suppose. Go home with your ships and your men and lord it over your myrmidons. But I care nothing for you. I don't mind if you are in a rage. Now I give you fair warning. Since Apollo robs me of Chryseis, I will send her home with my own ship and crew. But I will take your beautiful Briseis. And I will come for her myself to your quarters for your prize to show you how much stronger I am than you are. Then others will take care not to stand up to me and say they're, they are as good as I am. And he goes on to say this pierced Achilles to the heart. Now, those that's Agamemnon. Okay, right off the bat, this guy is a megalomaniac asshole. Okay, a self-centered megalomaniac asshole narcissist, of course, you know, and uh, this is how he treats the guy who, as you heard Achilles say, does most of the fighting, you know, and has done most of the, uh, the fighting on this idiot's behalf. Hmm. Very interesting. But in that segment, see if, um, see if you can guess what I'm seeing uh, and who I'm seeing in metaphor there. Okay, so let's go to another section of the book. If you're just uh, joining us, uh, I'm talking about the books, the Iliad and the Odyssey, and I will be sharing uh, the method I was taught to read these books uh, by my mentor, the method that um, kind of unlocked my understanding of um, what these books actually represent. Um, but for now, I'm just sharing with you the context of the book, the background of the story, and excerpts from the Iliad at the moment. Let's see. Okay. Now, at one point, um, before Achilles decides to return to the fight. 
one of the things that convinces him to do it is his mother goes to, now remember, his mother's a goddess. She goes into the underworld to Hephaestus and has Hephaestus um, uh, fashion him a new set of armor. And one of the pieces of that armor was his shield. Now, I was told by my mentor that when I read the Odyssey, or the Iliad, to take note and study on the shield of Achilles. Okay? So, um, when you go into the book, the description of the shield goes on for several pages. And it tells a story, a narrative of two cities or city-states. One city-state is not dedicated to war. It's dedicated to peace and um, prosperity. And the story in the shield of the figures that are carved onto the face of the shield uh, tells the story of a, a peaceful um, city civilization where people are prosperous and it's good times. The other city state is one that's dedicated to warfare and destruction and everything there is misery and and on and so forth it's it's contrast right that's what you're seeing is contrast but there's also um the bands around the shield the outer band is the cosmos okay so you have this context of uh, the cosmos being the stars outer space and then you know um the story of this this civilization. Let me let me read a little bit of the description of this shield to you. First, he fashioned a shield, lar large and strong, adorning it with beautiful designs all over. He made a threefold rim round the edge of shining metal and slung it on a silver baldric. There were five layers of hide in the shield. On the surface, he laid his clever designs in metal. Upon it he wrought the earth and the sky and the sea, the untiring sun and the full moon, and all the stars that encircle the sky, Pleiades and Hyades, Orion the mighty hunter, and the bear, which men also called the Wain, which revolves in its place and watches Orion, and alone of them all never takes a bath in the ocean. Now let me, um... Okay, I'm making sure I'm staying according to my plan. Reading, con reading on, continuing with the description of Achilles' new shield. Upon it he fashioned two cities of mortal men, and fine ones. In the first was wedding and feasting. They were leading brides from their chambers along the streets under the light of blazing torches and singing the bridal song. There were dancing boys twirling about, pipes and harps made a merry noise. The women stood at their doors and watched. A crowd was in the marketplace where a dispute was going on. Now, all this is carved intricately, okay? Um, crowd was in the marketplace where a dispute was going on. Two men disputed over the blood price of a man who had been killed. One said he had offered all and told his tale before the people. The other refused to accept anything, but both were willing to appeal to an umpire for the decision. The crowd cheered one or other as they took sides, and the heralds kept them in order. The elders sat in the sacred circle on the polished stones, and each took the herald's staff as they rose and turned to give judgment. Before them lay two nuggets of gold for the one who should give the fairest judgment. The other city had two armies besieging it round about, all in shining armor. They were divided in plan whether to sack it outright or to take half the wealth of the city in ransom. But the besieged were by no means ready to agree, and they were preparing an ambush. The wives and little children were left to guard the walls with the old men. The others sallied out, led by Ares and Pallas Athena. Both worked in gold with golden robes, fine and tall in their armor like real gods, conspicuous above men who were much smaller. When they arrived at the place chosen for their ambush near a river where all the animals came to drink, they settled down to wait under arms. Meanwhile, they had sent out two scouts, who sat a long way off to see when the cattle and sheep were coming. Soon they came, with two herdsmen playing on their pipes and suspecting nothing. 
So the men in ambush had good warning and quickly got round the cattle and fine white sheep, cut out the whole convoy, and killed the herdsmen. The besiegers were still sitting in conclave when they heard the news. They were off at once behind their prancers, arrived in no time, stopped, and fought their battle along the river banks with volleys of spears from both sides. And there were among and there among them was discord, there was tumult, there was cruel fate holding one just wounded and still alive, and one unwounded, dragging one dead by the feet, and the cloak she wore on her shoulders was red with the blood of men. So it, it goes on and on. And I, I mean, that's, it's, you could almost imagine um, it's a carving, a relief carving, intricate. You know, if you've ever seen, um, I think they're Chinese, um, the, the, those intricate carvings that you see sometimes in museums or even, you know, some Chinese restaurants that I've been to have these. And they're just incredible, the tiny little detail. But you can almost see, you know, as you're reading this description, you can see the shield and you can almost see them moving as it's described, you know. Um, it, it's very interesting. Um, it goes, like I said, it goes on and on um, down to... And the, the mighty river of Okeanos at the extreme edge of the shield, so the outer edge. When the shield was finished, he fashioned a corslet that shone brighter than fire. He fashioned a strong helmet with a golden crest. He fashioned greaves of flexible tin. Then the famous craftsman brought all he had made and laid it before Thetis. That's Achilles' mother, the goddess. And she shot like a falcon from snowy Olympus, bearing the bright armor to her son. So... She has gotten her son, Achilles, to agree to go back into the fight if she brings him this special armor. So she does. She brings it back to them. Uh, Achilles agrees to go to Agamemnon, and that's the scene I described before, where he goes and he says, hey, let bygones be bygones. It's cool. You know, you shafted me, but, I, you know, there's other men whose lives depend upon me, you know, fighting in this, this war. So I'll join the fray again. And, and Agamemnon comes out, well, it's not my fault, man. Don't blame me. Typical. I mean, we've been talking about narcissists a lot on this channel lately, but he's a big fat narcissist. Nothing's ever his fault, you know, um, but everything is for his glory when it works out good. And uh, think about it. That should sound like someone to you. Um so, you know, that's, that's another dynamic that's going on in the story. And all the while, you know, Odysseus is there. He's part of this because he's, you know, he's a king. Um, now, another section I want to read to you that demonstrates a taste of Achilles. Again, if you're just logging on, I'm just sharing uh, bits of the Iliad to give you a feel for um, the context, a feel for the uh, dynamic um, of this story. Now, as, as you might guess, many of you know, the original is in verse, okay? And it was sang by the ancient storytellers. That's how they would remember the story, that it was you know, musically locked into their heads in a verse sense. Okay. These of course are written in, you know, narrative prose like novels. And I have always used the WHD Rouse uh, translation. That was the one that my uh, mentor, you know, suggested I use. And these have been around for uh, getting close to a hundred years. Um, I think maybe maybe 75 years, something like that. But um, th this is in the narrative form, okay? Um, when Achilles goes back into battle, he... Let me, let me make sure I'm giving you the, the right order of this. Let me make sure. Okay, yeah, he, he is really, by the time we get to the battle by the river, the chapter's called, Achilles is stone cold pissed off because his best friend was killed, okay, by Hector. The besieging army 
Mycenaeans, Danaeans, you know, the Myrmidons with Achilles. They've got the uh, Trojan army on the run. And Achilles has uh, uh, one of the princes, one of the sons of King Priam of Troy on the run, and, and he's got him cornered, okay? And they're at the river. And uh, I'll, I'll read to you. It's one of my favorite parts. And you'll probably recognize where a particular legendary movie got, you know, a particular phrase. So uh, this is the, uh, the young prince of Troy. The young man had been trembling and hoping for mercy. And as Achilles lifted the spear, the young man ran up so that the spear missed his shoulder and stuck in the ground. With one hand, he embraced the knees of Achilles. With the other, he caught hold of the spear and would not let go as he spoke out his simple prayer. I beseech you, Achilles, have mercy and spare me. Uh, blah, blah, blah. I came back to Ilias after much suffering and he's, he's begging for his life. Short and sad was my life to be if my mother had but known when she brought me forth. He tells this long, woeful story um, why Achilles should spare him, right? Now, he's just been out there helping kill Achilles' friends and running his mouth and everything, okay? This guy was a real, you know, cocksurety. You've heard me talk about that. And, and uh, he, he screwed up. He got pinned down by Achilles. So, uh, but listen, sir, this is something you may have forgotten. Don't kill me. I am only half brother of Hector who killed your friend so gentle and so strong. So, you know, again, after running his mouth, he's, he's kind of pinned down. I'll read on. But Achilles was not to be softened. And this was his answer. Fool, don't talk of ransom to me. Don't make speeches. Before practice, Patroclos met his doom, mercy was rather more to my mind. I took many Trojans alive and sold them, but now not one shall escape death of all that God puts into my hands, not one Trojan of them all, most especially no son of Priam. Come, my friend, die too. Why do you cry like that? Patroclos died, and he was a much better man than you. Don't you see me too, a fine big man? My father is a brave man, my mother is a goddess. Yet I too have death and fate fast upon me. The day shall come, morning or evening or midday, when someone shall take my life in battle, with a thrust of the spear or an arrow from the bow. The young man's knees gave way. His heart failed him. He let go the spear and sank to the ground in a heap, with both hands outspread. Achilles drew the sword from the sheath and thrust it down to the hilt in his neck. He fell flat on the ground while the blood ran out and sank into the earth. Achilles dragged him away by the leg and threw him into the river, saying with rough plainness, Lie there now with the fishes, and they will blood lick your wound without any trouble. No mother shall lay you out and mourn for you, but Scamandros will roll you in his eddies to the broad bosom of the deep. Many a leaping fish will dart up under the black ripples to eat the white fat of Lycaon. Perdition to you all, till we come as far as the citadel of sacred Ilios. You fleeing, I cutting down the rear most. Not even that river shall help you. The river with its deep stream and silver eddies. The river to whom you have sacrificed so many bulls for so many years and thrown so many horses alive into its eddies. For all that, you shall perish miserably until you all shall pay for my friend's blood and the lives of those whom you slew before our ships while I was away from the battle. And uh, th that's the end of the young prince like Kay. And you recognize the line from the Godfather, he sleeps with the fishes, right? That's where that comes from. Is <laughs> Achilles just whoosh, runs the sword right through his body, tosses him into the river and says... Let the fish nibble you. No mother will mourn your remains. It's great. It's beautiful. When, when you've read this much of the story, you just really dig, you know, moments like that. It's great stuff. I love later when more of the uh, the sons of Priam, you know, of Troy come to him. Achilles calls out to them, who are you that dare come and face me? What is your family? Unhappy are they whose sons face my wrath. I mean, it's it's great stuff. Achilles is full on pissed off by the time we get to this point in the book. Now, um, after I studied these books the way I was instructed by my mentor, 
Um, admittedly, what I started seeing first as far as metaphor for one's own life um, started emerging from things in the Odyssey before things from the Iliad. I had not been to a war zone um, until later in my career. I had never been, you know, been in a, in a certain context in my life for the Iliad stuff to emerge until later. And um, the, a lot of the stuff in the Odyssey started emerging for me in my life before. And um, I find that interesting because as you'll learn later, I, I was instructed to read the Odyssey first. And this book is essentially supposed to be the sequel, as it were. This is the story of Odysseus trying to get home to Ithaca after finally, you know, the Trojan War ends. Um, and it takes him longer to get home, I think, than uh, it did wasting all that time. But um, I, I, I debated whether... I, like I said, I'm going to save the method that I was taught to study these books and read these books uh, until later. But um, here's what the Iliad represents to me um, right now. Agamemnon is the Yahweh. Agamemnon is a powerful warlord who bullies all his allies, commands them, talks about his greatness and his glory and how powerful he is. And if you dare disrespect him, he's going to punish you and show you how powerful he is. That sounds like the asshole Yahweh that we've talked about before. And so I thought, well, if Agamemnon is representative of Yahweh from this is my perspective. You don't have to agree with it, okay? And it's my perspective. I don't care if anyone disagrees with it. That's cool. I, this is my perspective. The, the Iliad, to me, represents the conflict between what we're told in churchianity is God versus the devil, okay? And so it's Yahweh has this conflict with you know, what has become called the devil. And um, he drags all of us into it. Okay, this, this model that we're taught in Sunday school or what have you, that, you know, we're all subject to this being, this particular being, okay? And uh, there's a war going on and it's, oh, we, 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 have to, we have to be dragged into it even peripherally because we're told it's all for us, it's all for us, it's over our souls and all this stuff. Well, I've come to think, wait a minute. Uh, first of all, I, I'm, I'm not buying that Yahweh is the all, this almighty God that we're told about. It, it just His character, his personality, everything we know about him from the Old Testament and other writings, just that doesn't measure up, that he's some great, wonderful, caring, you know, uh, truly almighty being. Um, he has this tremendous ego and, and that's, that's the least of it. But he has a bunch of people convinced that he is the, the, the one true almighty God. Um, just like Agamemnon boasts in the Iliad, okay, that he's the, you know, the mightiest of them all and you better listen to what he says or you'll suffer for it. I mean, my God, it's, it's identical in that sense. So just like Agamemnon dupes the other, the lesser kings and, and gets them to raise their armies to, to go into this, this war over an adulterous wife, okay? Uh, talk about a personal issue, a personal conflict, okay? We've been dragged into this, um, model based on the you know the 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 book of abraham right 
or whatever you want to call it, um, the Yahwistic religions, we're dragged into this model that, um, you know, we have to care about this conflict and, and we, or, you know, we, we have to be part of it. Well, I, I don't know. My, my perspective is no, we don't. So, uh, you know, when I see, I see Achilles as the right thinker, he's the one who, who tells Agamemnon to go pound sand, you know, screw you. You know, I do all the fighting for you. This is a personal conflict. This is something your brother has a, your brother has an errant wife. He's got a bad marriage. He picked the wrong girl, right? And so, you know, everybody else has to be dragged into this uh, personal conflict, this personal issue. It, to me, it kind of rhymes with this character whom we're told is God has this conflict with this other guy whom we're told is the devil. And we have to be dragged into the middle of it. Well, no, no, we do not. And that's the Achilles choice. You know, yeah, I mean, Odysseus and Diomedes and all of them who are very wise, they, they're even weary of this. They see through Agamemnon what an asshole he is. But there it is, this ongoing conflict, this never-ending conflict, right? Um, it, it To me, it sounds like um, the whole thing about crusading, you know, the, the army of the Mycenaeans or the, you know, Danaeans, whatever the, and the Myrmidons and all of them, the invading force besieging Troy, um, they're almost like crusaders, right? You know, um, they're going to bring Troy down. Troy represents worldliness, you know, that evil world out there that secular world that isn't on its knees to this essentially warlord who set himself up as an almighty God, a liar. Okay. Remember Christ said to his, to the priests of Yahweh, you are the sons of your father, the devil and a liar. So, um, Make of that what you will. I know the thumpers are going to be saying, you're not a scholar. You're misinterpreting that. You know, yeah, okay, go ahead with your trust me, bro beliefs. But this is what the Iliad has come to represent to me, that we can choose to not participate like Achilles. And I, remember, my mentor is the one who taught me to read these books and study them. And, you know, things would come to me, he said. He said, you will understand what's going on when you read these books in the way that I'm going to teach you to read them. You'll understand what's what's going on with history. You'll understand what's going on in the world. You understand what's going on with your own life. Okay. Um, so, uh, you know, there there's a bit of just a bit of the Iliad. I don't want to go too much into the story because you should read these books. They, they really are great classic reads. I mean, it's, it's a, just a fantastic story. It's considered, you know, the first greatest story in Western literature. Um, so then we come to the Odyssey. And again, the Odyssey follows up the, um, Trojan War, the events in the Trojan War. And it focuses on Odysseus, who's trying to get home. He just wants to get home to his wife, Penelope, okay, and his son, uh, Telemachus. And um, he just can't seem to get there. There's all these things that get in his way, okay? Um, so when when the Odyssey begins, we, we're in Ithaca. We see um, Odysseus's wife, Queen Penelope is trying to hold the fort. Her husband's been away for years. There's all these suitors lined up. Okay. There's these horn dogs basically that want to, you know, bed Penelope, make her their queen, and they want to take all of Odysseus's land and property. Okay. And his own treasures and things like that. They're, they're not really an ally to him. You know, they're, uh, they didn't go off to the Trojan War. They're here trying to get in his wife's pants is essentially what's going on and to get all his stuff, you know. And Telemachus is the son who's coming of age and it's frustrated because he loves his dad. He respects his dad. And he don't, he don't, and he doesn't like the way these men are, are treating his mother. 
and talking to his mother that, you know, they're telling her, Hey, you're going to have to choose one of us. You know, your husband's dead. Just forget about him. You know, choose one of us. Ha ha ha. And you know, they'll basically that they want to use her and get all the riches and, and whatever. And, you know, this is like the, uh, you know, think about it. This is like the young kid who's, um, you know, dad is off doing something or maybe dad is, you know, passed on or dad's not on the scene and he has to endure all these uh, potential stepdads coming around trying to bang his mom. You know, the, the, this there, there's even that drama in uh, Telemachus's life. OK. And um, he's going to go out and find his father. Well, Penelope, uh, under the pressure of the suitors. Um, she agrees that when she finishes the tapestry she's working on, she will choose one of these swinging dicks, horn dogs, to be her next husband. She'll just give up on Odysseus. She doesn't really want to give up on Odysseus. So every night she unwinds all the work she did that day. So basically she's never finishing this tapestry and she leads them on for quite a while by doing that trick, but then they figure it out. Oh, meanwhile, all the handmaids of Odysseus's court that are supposed to be loyal to him and Penelope, they're all drinking it up and having orgies and banging the uh, suitors and the suitors soldiers. So the handmaidens who are supposed to be loyal employees, right? They're, they're sharing all of Odysseus's fine wine and, and scooping up the food, you know, from Odysseus's food stores. And they're, you know, having these orgies with these guys and ha ha ha, living it up, you know, to heck with the boss and his wife. We're having a good time. We're young. We want to have a party. And, um, you know, they're telling the suitors, you know, whenever they see Penelope doing something, you know, that she doesn't want them to know and all that. So anyway, they call her on it and um, she realizes, okay, I have to finish the tapestry. And when it's done, I have to pick one of these assholes to be my new husband. Tele uh, Telemachus. Some people call him Telemachus or Telemachus, whatever. You, you decide for yourself. Um, I often say Telemachus. He's off and he's learning about people who have encountered his father. He even goes and sees Menelaus, who, by the way, by the way, after the Trojan War, you know, Helen causes this. Tell me if this ain't typical of this kind of crap. Helen causes this destructive war that goes on for a decade. Okay. And then by the Odyssey, oh, let bygones be bygones. She's back with Menelaus, the happy wife, you know, as if nothing happened. Thousands of men didn't die because of her fickleness, right? No, no, no. There wasn't destruction and men years away from home and all this bad stuff, you know. No, no. She decides, oh, I guess I want to be with my husband again. I mean, Jesus. Um, wow. You know, what are we to say about that? Helen, Helen of Troy, no matter how good looking she was, wasn't worth one minute of the strife in anyone's life to go get her back. Menelaus was a fool and an idiot. Okay. He should have just let Paris have her. You know, if they wanted to bring Troy down that badly, they could have done it a lot sooner by just letting, <laughs> letting them have Helen because she would have caused dissension and destroyed them too, eventually with her wishy-washy, selfish ways, but no, you know, Menelaus had to go, you know, save his pride. Um, guys, don't waste your time in saving your pride over an issue like that. Let the other guy have her. Um, anyway, um, that's always been my policy and it works well irritates the living hell out of the errant one. <laughs> anyway, that's my advice. Um, so, uh, so uh, you know, Telemachus visits the court of Menelaus, and there's Helen, the cause of all the strife, just living it up, you know, having her wine and grapes and, and uh, fancy food and back to her life, um, living her best life. Um, so uh, 
Odysseus is still out there. And when we first see Odysseus, he's on Calypso's island. Now, Calypso is this witch goddess, um, and uh, she kind of with glamoury and with love bombing has Odysseus captive on her island. But he misses home. He misses Penelope. He misses his son. And, you know, after some initial uh, merrymaking, because here's the funny thing you'll find in the Odyssey, Odysseus, you know, all his adventures, oh, I must get home to my wife. I must get home to my wife. And he just, he beds a bunch of women on the way home to get back to his wife. I, you know, you kind of go, hey, guy, I guess you don't miss her that much, right? But um, yeah, there he is with Calypso. And after the initial merrymaking and all the love making and all that stuff, he, he's finally, you know, again, missing his wife, missing home. So he spends his time on the beach, looking out to the sea, weeping. And um, finally, the gods decide, thanks to Athena, who, uh, thank God, is, is there on Odysseus's side and always watches out for him. She argues on Olympus, you know, hey, all you gods that are shitting on Odysseus, he's one of the finest men who ever lived. Knock it off. You know, he deserves some mercy. So uh, they agree. And Zeus sends Hermes, the messenger, to order Calypso to let Odysseus go. So she begrudgingly does, and she provides him the means to build a raft. And he builds that raft, and off he goes. He leaves Calypso finally. He's been with her for years, you know. And uh, then he goes and uh, to another shore, and there's young Nausicaa. Um, and uh, he tells his story at the court of Nausicaa's father. Now, that goes into when he left Troy and he had his men in the ship and they were on their way home and they encounter the Cyclops, they encounter the Lotus Eaters, they encounter, you know, all these different adventures. Circe, the witch who turns men into pigs and um, with food and drink and all this stuff, flattery. And um, how he ends up alone on Calypso's island because, you know, all his men get killed along the way. And um, I want to choose some selections from the Odyssey to share with you. Oh, um, he, uh, he eventually does get back home to Ithaca and um, Athena disguises him as an old man, okay? And she tells him, hey, these suitors, you got to deal with them, but I'm going to disguise you as an old man. He reveals his true identity to very few. Reveals uh, the dog, one of his old loyal dogs, you got to love dogs, kind of reveals it to um, Odysseus's former nanny. Now, this is an old, old, they call it the Grampian nanny. And um, she recognizes him uh, when she sees the scar on his foot that she was there when it happened, when he was young and she looks up and realizes it's, it's, it's him. It's you. It's my master. And he's like, Shh. and the dog, the dog gets all happy because he knows his master, no matter what, how old he gets. And then Odysseus reveals himself to his son, Telemachus and to his loyal captain of the guard. And, and, you know, there are some loyal soldiers there and, uh, they make their plan. And Odysseus, um, it's one of my favorite sequences in all of literature and film and, and all of this kind of stuff is when Odysseus makes his return home. And he's just an old man and he's there in his own castle, whatever, you know, and he's looking at all these assholes playing, you know, slap and tickle with his handmaids who were yucking it up. And saying uh, derogatory things about, you know, what they want to do to Penelope and stuff like that. And uh, the day, the moment comes when Penelope has finished the tapestry and she's instructed by Athena. Athena comes to her and instructs her what to do. So this is where Penelope sets up the, the contest. And she, sets, she has set up 12 axes, okay? And the axe heads have this loop on them where there's a hole. Now, in some versions, it's the axe handles. In other versions, it's the axe head. The idea is that there's 12 of these set up in a row 
perfectly straight and they have to shoot an arrow through the loops okay straight through all the all 12 and they have to use odysseus's bow now odysseus had a scythian bow which is kind of different it's like a recurve wild recurve kind of thing antler type of thing anyway you have to know how to string that bow to begin with none of them can even string the bow okay they can't even string the bow much less they don't get a chance to shoot the arrow through the accentals but they're all drinking they're yucking it up ha 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 and um odysseus will try but before we get to that let me share with you some of my favorite moments um it is said and this gets into you know metaphor for a real journey perhaps that someone took um uh, books 9 through 11 or 12 talk about um it's odysseus recounting his long journey before being washed ashore on calypso's island alone um they visit the Lotus eaters, these are the people who eat the poppy seeds, the drugs, right? And, and they get some of the sailors to eat the same thing. And then they just want to stay. They don't want to go anywhere. They just want to be high and happy all the time. Now, there was a great episode of the original series of Star Trek in which they encounter the Lotus eaters and even Spock, it, the spore sprays in his face and even Spock smiles and laughs and everything's la-di-da and Kirk has to, just like Odysseus, Kirk has to round them up. But um, let me see, let me get to, yeah, so uh, there is, my, my point of this, after the Lotus Eaters, they visit the island of the Cyclops, the one-eyed giants, right? And they blind uh, Polyphemos, I think is his name, the son of um, Poseidon. That's why Poseidon's mad at Odysseus and makes it hard for him to get home because his men blinded Poseidon's son. So um, let's see, he tells this story. There is a scholar who says that, and then he goes um, after the Cyclops, I'm sorry, it, it's um, the Lotus Eaters Island or the land of the Lotus Eaters, then the Cyclops Island, then the Island of the Winds, than the land of the midnight sun. What's that sound like to you? Okay. And then Circe, then they encounter Circe. And then of course, it's the uh, kingdom of the dead, which I'll get into more here momentarily. Um, this looks like this is going to go longer than I usually go. That's for sure. Um, there is a scholar out there. There's been more than one scholar that's tried to map the journey of Odysseus. Now, most of them limit, contain the journey of Odysseus trying to get home from the Trojan War. They contain it in the Mediterranean. Okay, but there's one scholar who claims that from the land of the Lotus Eaters to the Cyclops Island to the Islands of the Wind to the the land of the obviously the land of the Midnight Sun and where Circe is. Uh, this one scholar argues that Odysseus passed through the Straits of Gibraltar and went into the Atlantic and went up the coast of Europe and on up to the Arctic Circle and over to the Americas, or at least Newfoundland and, and maybe, you know, Nova Scotia or something like that, that he, he actually, you know, went far beyond the Mediterranean. And I find that really interesting, personally. Um, and when you have, you know, talking about the land of the midnight sun, uh, well, that's kind of a clue that he ain't in the Mediterranean, okay, anymore. Well, probably my number one favorite, uh, although I do really love when Odysseus returns and takes his vengeance, but I, I love chapter 11, how Odysseus visited the kingdom of the dead. Um, he's giving, he is given instructions. Let me see. I'll read through this. When we reached our ship lying on the beach, the first thing we did was to launch her into the sea. Then we set up mast and sail. Now they have a ram and a U, E W E, a ram and a U, a black ram, um, on the boat with them. Okay. That they were instructed to take. 
The radiant goddess Circe sent a sail-filling wind behind us. We came at last to the deep stream of Okeanos, which is the world's boundary. Okay, there they are coming to the, the ocean sea, the ocean stream, right? That's gates of Gibraltar right there. There is the city of the Sumerian people, wrapped in mist and cloud. Blazing Helios never looks down on them with his rays, not when he mounts into the starry sky, nor when he returns from the sky to earth. But, but abominable night is forever spread over those unhappy mortals. What does that sound like to you? Again, a place of darkness, uh, endless night, abominable night is forever spread. You know, that's another suggestion that uh, maybe they're not within the confines of the Mediterranean Sea anymore. There we beached our ship and put the animals ashore, and we walked along the shore until we came to the place where Circe had described. Perimides and Eurylochus held fast the victims, the ram and the ewe, while I drew my sword and dug the pit a cubit's length, along and across. I poured out the drink offering for all souls, first with honey and milk, then with fine wine, and the third time with water, and I sprinkled white barley meal over it. Earnestly I prayed to the empty shells of the dead, and promised that when I came to Ithaca, I would sacrifice to them in my own house a pharaoh cow, the best I had, and heap fine things on the blazing pile. To Tiresias alone, in a different place, I would dedicate the best black ram among my flocks. When I had made prayer and supplication to the company of the dead, I cut the victims' throats over the pit, and the red blood poured out. Then the souls of the dead who had passed away came up in a crowd from Erebus, young men and brides, old men who had suffered much, and tender maidens to whom sorrow was a new thing. Others killed in battle, Warriors clad in blood-stained armor, all this crowd gathered about the pit from every side with a dreadful great noise which made me pale with fear. I'm getting goosebumps. Odysseus, pale with fear. He's down in the land of the dead, and these of the dead come emerging out of the darkness, and they're all making a clamor to drink from the pit. But not yet. Then I told my men to take the victims which lay there slaughtered, the ram and the ewe, to flay them and burn them, and to pray to mighty Hades and awful Persephone. I myself with drawn sword sat still, and would not let the empty shells of the dead come near the blood until I had asked my questions of Tiresias. And then he goes on to the talking about this, the dead who come to him. First came the soul of my comrade Elpinor. Um, and he talks with Elpinor. Elpinor tells him how he died. Um, and this happens uh, a couple of times. And then we come to this. Odysseus says, Then came the soul of my dead mother, Anticlea, daughter of the brave Autilicus. She was alive when I left Ithaca on my voyage to sacred Ilion. See, he didn't know his mother died, and he learns about it when she emerges from the shadows among the dead down in Hades. Reading on, my tears fell when I saw her and I was moved with pity, but all the same I would not let her come near the blood before I had asked my questions of Tiresias, <laughs> his own mother among the dead, but he holds her at bay with that sword and will not allow her to drink that blood as instructed. I love this shit. Okay, Tiresias finally comes and says, "What? This is the dead Tiresias. He's among all these dead, and there's a whole bunch of them, by the way. It's like a crowd of them. Now, remember, they're surrounding Odysseus. They want the blood, and he's sitting there with his sword, keeping them at bay. Imagine how creepy that is. What brings you here, unhappy man, away from the light of the sun, to visit this unpleasing place of the dead? Move back from the pit, hold off your sharp sword, that I may drink of the blood and tell you the truth. As he spoke, I stepped back from the pit and pushed my sword into the scabbard. He drank of the blood, and only then spoke as the prophet without reproach. You seek to return home, mighty Odysseus, and home is sweet as honey, but God will make your voyage hard and dangerous, for I do not think the earth shaker will fail to see you, and he is furious against you because you blinded his son. 
Nevertheless, you may all get safe home still, although not without suffering much. If you can control yourself and your companions when you would traverse the sea as far as the island of Thrinacia, there you will find the cattle and sheep of Helios, who sees all things and hears all things. Now, remember, they were told... (laughs) They're told to leave the cattle of Helios alone and his men do not, right? So this is, you know, kind of him learning all the things that are going to happen. And then he tells him what to expect when he gets home. Tiresias, the dead Tiresias, the undead Tiresias is telling uh, Odysseus what he's going to find when he gets home. All these swing and dick suitors after his wife and his treasure. And he suggests how to handle it. Um... And then he finishes by saying, that which I tell you is true. So Odysseus says, ah, well, Tiresias, that is the thread which the gods have spun, and I have no say in the matter. But here is something I want to ask if you will explain it to me. I see over there the soul of my dead mother. She remains in silence, near the blood, and she would not look at the face of her own son or say a word to him. Tell me, prince, how may she know me for what I am? Tiresias answered, I will give you an easy rule to remember. If you let any one of the dead come near the blood, he will tell you what is true. If you refuse, he will go away. Now, remember, when I was taught how to do necromancy, how to practice necromancy and raise the dead, I I was not instructed to dig a a pit one cubit wide, one cubit deep, and fill it with fresh blood. (laughs) I was just told a particular way to raise the dead and that they would answer my questions. Um. I was told that, um, I asked, I said, now, will this be scary? And my mentor laughed and said, hell yeah. He goes, it's hair raising. He goes, you'll find your knees going weak, but don't you walk away. If you have to sit down, sit down, but you stay there, you hold your ground and you insist and the dead will give you the answers to your questions. That wasn't written in here. That was instructed to me in 1990. All I can tell you is what I was told and what I tried. I did go out to Old Northport Cemetery on Long Island. I picked me a particular person and did my own little journey to the land of the dead. So he tells him, you know, let them drink from the blood and they'll answer your questions. And uh, so, so, uh, We'll read on. When he had said this, the soul of Prince Tiresias returned into the house of Hades, having uttered his oracles. So he went back into the shadows and into the underground. But I stayed where I was until my mother came near and drank the red blood. At once she knew me and made her meaning clear with lamentable words. Now imagine seeing your mother, one of the undead, kneeling down on hands and knees, putting her face to the pit and lapping at the blood in a pit in dark Hades. And you didn't know she was dead. Until she shows up like that. The imagery. My love, how did you come down to the cloudy gloom and you alive? It is hard for the living to see this place. There are great rivers between and terrible streams, Okeanos first of all, which no one can ever cross by walking, but only if he has a well-found ship. Are you on your way from Troy? Have you been wandering about with ship and crew all this time? Haven't you ever been back to Ithaca and seen your wife in your own house? Odysseus answers, Dear mother, necessity has brought me to the house of Hades, for I had to consult the soul of Tiresias. I have not been near Achia or set foot in our country. I have been driven about incessantly in toil and trouble ever since I first sailed with King Agamemnon for Troy to see its fine horses and to fight with its people. But do tell me, really and truly, what was the cause of your death? How did you die? Was it a long disease? My beloved mother answered at once. Wait a minute now, where's the part? His mother replies, And this is how I sickened and died. The archerist did not shoot me in my own house with those gentle shafts that never miss. It was no disease that made me pine away, but I missed you so much, and your clever wit and your gay merry ways, and the life was sweet no longer. So I died. Odysseus says, 
When I heard this, I longed to throw my arms round her neck. Three times I tried to embrace the ghost. Three times it slipped right through my hands like a shadow or a dream. A sharp pang pierced my heart, and I cried out straight from my heart to hers. Why don't you stay with me when I long to embrace you? My dear mother answered, Persephone is not deceiving you. She is the daughter of Zeus, but this is only what happens to mortals when one of us dies. As soon as the spirit leaves the white bones, the sinews no longer hold flesh and bones together. The blazing fire consumes them all. Make haste back to the light, but do not forget all this. Tell it to your wife by and by. So there he is in this dark, scary place. The people line up, the dead line up to kneel down and lap at the blood in the pit. But there he's seen his mother. And he finds out that his mom didn't die of old age. A disease didn't get her. She dies of heartbreak because he left. I mean, the pathos of that, right? I, I mean, talk about he probably already feels like shit because he ran off on this stupid war with the asshole Agamemnon and you know his mother has died of a broken heart he's gone so long and he learns this when he sees her among the blood lapping undead in Hades that, that's just wow right that's just a masterpiece right there um and of course you know he leaves the the land of the dead and and such now when he does, as I said, when he does get home, he um, he's disguised as an old man. He's in the hall when Penelope announces the contest, which was set up by Athena. And um, various suitors get up and try. They can't even string the bow, right? So they're all drinking. They're all laughing at each other. It's just a big joke. And then Odysseus is urged by Athena to go give it a try. And they're laughing at him. Okay, old man, whatever. Yeah, you know, us strong young men, we can't string the bow. But yeah, you're an old man. You're going to try. And they're laughing it up. Ha, 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 big party. And uh, the old man goes up there and he's looking at the bow, you know, locks it into place by his foot, bends it, strings it. And there's a couple of the suitors watching. They're like, uh, guys, the old man just strung the bow. We couldn't do it. And he just did it in like two quick actions. So as more and more of them are curious about who is this old guy that strung the bow, he lifts up the bow, checks it out, plucks the string a little bit, draws an arrow, draws back the bow. And they're wondering, how is this old man doing this? And he releases the arrow and it shoots right through the 12 axe handles and hits its mark. Bullseye. That's the moment that the suitors, particularly the lead asshole trying to get in his wife's pants, the jaw drops, the eyes go wide, and they go, oh shit. And at that moment, Athena removes the veil, and Odysseus looks like himself again. And they all see Odysseus standing up there, having just won the contest. And that's when they're woes begin. Because one of the most beautiful segments in literature is Odysseus taking his revenge. He and Telemachus, his captain of the guards and the other few loyal soldiers that he has, they have put bars on the doors so that the suitors cannot escape. Odysseus, Telemachus, and his loyal guard slaughter the suitors in one big battle. It's, it is a bloodbath. One of the really great moments is when Odysseus with his bow shoots an arrow through the neck of the main suitor who was after his wife, the most boastful one. Okay. The one that forced her into making a choice. He just drops him dead when it's all over. And Odysseus is obviously returned and he's back in charge. And the suitors are all laying there, you know, cut up, their guts spilled out, the, the blood covering the floor of the banquet hall. Okay. What Odysseus does next is he instructs Telemachus to bring all the handmaidens, all of them, to him there in the room. He forces the disloyal handmaidens the ones who really helped the suitors get away with ransacking everything and chasing his wife. 
he he instructs them, orders them to scrub the hall clean. They have to mop up the blood. They have to get on their hands and knees and scrub every drop of remaining blood. Every They have to clean everything up after the battle, move the bodies out and everything. He makes them do that. Then when they're done cleaning up the hall, he has some ropes brought from his a ship. And he hangs every one of the handmaidens in the hall. They're all just hanging there, doing the Spandau Ballet foot dance as they die. He makes them clean up the mess that they helped make, that they contributed to making. Then he gives them their reward. He's pretty ruthless and cold. But hey, you know, within the context of that world, they deserved it. And it's just when you're reading this, you're going, yes, yes. You know, you, that that kind of literary vengeance is just, it's beautiful. It's a thing of beauty. And then, you know, of course, in the end, Athena comes down and brokers a peace and all that. But, um, but you know, that's basically, you know, the highlights of the story of the Odyssey. Now, um, now we come to my gosh, I've been on an hour and 15 minutes and I'm just now getting to this. So like I told you, this is going to be a longer show than usual. Um, I found that events in the Odyssey are symbolic. And I, I'm not the only one or the first one to say this. There are scholars out there that have pointed this out. Um, that the things that happen in the Odyssey to Odysseus represent moments, episodes, and and conflicts and uh, obstacles, challenges in a man's life. Okay, um, the the one of the interesting things that um, I began to notice was that the women Odysseus encounters represent the different relationships, the type of relationships that a man can encounter in his life. Now, I want to caveat this. I, I, I'm, I'm male. My mentor was male. Um, Odysseus is a guy, okay? Uh, I don't know if this is a myth for females. I think they probably have their own, and I think that because there's a scholar, many of you probably heard of Robert Johnson. He wrote this trilogy of books years ago, uh, He, She, and We. He is masculine psychology told through a, a myth. She is feminine psychology told through a myth. And then we, of course, how with those two psychologies, how, uh, you know, relationships can be um, uh, navigated through that kind of thing. So I refer um, ladies to Robert Johnson's works and to myths where the central figure is a female, because I think uh, in those stories, women are going to have their equivalent of the Iliad and the Odyssey. Now, I could be wrong about that. I, 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 I only know one female who uh, was instructed to read these, but I don't know from what perspective. Um, so, I, I, you know, I could see where, you know, maybe this is a, you know, a, a male myth kind of thing. But ladies, if you want to understand your man, you'll probably get something out of this. But, um, for instance, I've been married a couple times. I've lived with a few women. And what's interesting is I can point to you which among them are the female characters in the Odyssey. My first wife, she was kind of a, a Circe. More Circe than Calypso but a bit of a Calypso. Um, I had a girlfriend who was much, much younger than me. Um, and I realized she's Nausicaa. And just like I, uh, I didn't follow the example of Odysseus. Odysseus, when he lands on the shores and the young nubile girl comes up to him and she's all pretty and all that, you know, sexy in that young way. 
but he, you know, he's very respectful and doesn't get involved with her. He's finally learned his lesson about just being caution to the wind. You know, I mean, first of all, he's married, right? But um, I, I, I should have followed Odysseus' example, and that should never have uh, become a relationship. I should have recognized her for being Nausicaa, and I would have been better off not, not going there. But dummy me, you know. Um, you don't always follow Odysseus's example, unfortunately. Uh, and let's see. Um, I'm trying to think who my second wife would have corresponded to in the Odyssey. Um, she was a Circe. She again, and you'll meet multiple times in your life. You know, it's a type, right? It's an archetype. And, um, and I'm sure there's a myth for women who encounter assholes that are archetypes for the jerks they've met in their personal lives. I'm not saying that there isn't a myth for the ladies. I'm saying that this appears to be a myth for the guys. Um, but, uh, uh, and, and there's situations like the Scylla and the Charybdis. Well, that's between being between a rock and a hard place, right? When, when you just have to move forward, even when you got danger on both sides of you, right? That, that's an easy metaphor right there. And then, um, uh, you know, the Lotus eaters. Okay. That's a metaphor for, um, you know, there's people that just want to uh, just live a life of comfort and be drugged out, right? And, uh, you know, whether it's alcohol or drugs or whatever, and um, they just don't want to face the outside world. They just want to stay there in their wonderland. And, um, you know, Odysseus wants to get home. What does that represent? Well, the lotus eaters among us, they don't always get a lot done, right? They just want to lay around eating their lotus, you know, drinking their booze smoking their dope, you know, to an excess. That's what, that's what this is about. To the extent that you're not getting anything else done in your life, that's what the Lotus Eaters represent. That's my takeaway from it. Um, and, and, you know, you can go through the story and all the other things he encounters. Um, you can see, you can look back on your own life and go, oh, wow, that's when I was in that situation. That's when I was with that person whoa, this is weird, you know, um, and uh, not so much with the Iliad in the early years, because there were just certain things I hadn't, um, experienced in life. But I think the Iliad is a metaphor for something much bigger, um, outside of us. Whereas the Odyssey is the metaphor for the personal life and the, the things you will encounter, the archetypes that you will encounter. Um, so, uh, how, how did I come to this where I can talk about, um, recognizing things in my own life or recognizing historical things or, um, or, uh, spiritual things after having read these books? Well, it's truly because of the way I was taught to read them. My mentor in the mid 80s, around 86, 86, 87, told me to read the Iliad. He said, get both books. He goes, read them. So, I started reading the Iliad because chronologically it takes place before the Odyssey. Okay. This one here. Now I've been reading since I was four years old. I've always been an advanced reader when I was a kid and I love reading. Um, but I was reading the WHD Rouse translation of the Iliad. And what was weird was I couldn't focus I, I couldn't retain anything. It, it wasn't making sense. It was, it was odd because, you know, I'm in my twenties and I've all, I can read, I, you know, I don't have any comprehension issues at all, that kind of thing. But it was weird. It's like my mind wasn't processing it. It, it was like chatter and chaos. So I told him, I said, Hey, I, I've been trying for a week to read this book 
and I'm having this weird experience. It, you know, I told him and he said, yeah, I'll bet you are. Now, here's how you should read those books. And he gave me the instructions, which I'm going to give you now. So I'll give you a moment to grab uh, some paper. And uh, so you can write this down. Now, remember, folks, if you're new here, because I see Ting Ting Shiny's asking me a question, I don't answer questions until I go to the live chat, okay? I'm only glancing in there now because I'm giving people a chance to um, get something to write on. So please save your, all your questions and comments that you want me to see until I open it up to the live chat. And, and you must, okay, please listen to me on this. You must write them in all caps please. There's a lot of side conversations um, going on in live chats. And for me to know that you're asking me a question or making a comment you want me to acknowledge, I need to be able to see that it's for me. And the only way that I'm going to know that at a glance is if you put it in all caps. So I know there's going to be somebody who just heard me say that and they're not going to do it. Then your question won't be answered. Okay. So thank you. Thank you. So now I will go into how to, how I was instructed to read the Iliad and the Odyssey. Okay. Now we know that the Iliad chronologically takes place first, but you will read the Odyssey first. Okay. You will start um, on the first, hear me out on this. You know what? Just, I'll explain it to you. I'll, I'll tell you how to do it. You just do it, okay? Um, start with the W.H.D. Rouse translation of the Odyssey, the narrative one, and uh, start on the first Monday of a given month. You might have to wait till next month to do this. The first Monday of a given month. On that day, you will read chapter one and set it aside. On Tuesday, chapter two. Wednesday, chapter three, and so forth. But you will only read five chapters in that given week. So you will only read one chapter, okay, each day, Monday through Friday. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And over the weekend, you'll set the book aside. You will not read it. You won't particularly think about it. You'll set it aside. Then the next Monday, start with chapter 6 and read chapters 6 through 10, one chapter a day, Monday through Friday. Put the book down. We're talking about the Odyssey. Same thing. Forget about it over the weekend. The following Monday, start chapter 11. You get the idea. Now, when you get down to the last few chapters, yes, you're only going to read like you know, the last week, it's only going to be like two or three chapters or whatever. So you're only going to read on the Monday, Tuesday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, you know, don't be pedantic, but you know, follow this instruction. Okay. One chapter a day, only reading on Mondays through Fridays until you finish the book. Now, when you finish it, put it down, put it aside for 30 days a month. Okay. That month later. So what have you done? You've taken one period of the better part of 30 days and you've read the book a chapter at a time, according to the specific instructions I've given you Monday through Friday, only one chapter to only one chapter a day. Don't make notes. Don't do anything like that. You finish the book. You've set it aside for 30 more days. Just, you don't read it. You just you know, you can, it'll be in your head or whatever, but if it's not, that's okay too. Then, okay, at the beginning of that next month, which should be the third month in this process, note that down, at the beginning of the third month in the process, you've read the book the first month, you've not read anything, you've ignored it, you put it aside for the second month, the beginning of that third month, that first day of that third month, 
You're going to pick it up and reread it, but you're going to do it at your own pace. You can read seven days of the week. You can read three chapters, five chapters a day, whatever you choose. When you reread it, you read it at your own pace. Okay. When you're done reading this at your own pace, you set it aside 30 days, roughly, you know, a month. Okay. Then again, okay. Or um, uh, at the beginning of, let's see, that's the one, two, three, four. Okay. The beginning of the fifth month. What have, okay. What have you done? You've read the book chapter at a time as instructed. You've set it aside. Then the third month, you've read it at your own pace. Um, you know, you kind of, you're the third, fourth month or whatever. You get the idea. After you read it, don't start the Iliad until 30 days later at least. But then on a Monday, do this exactly the way you did the Odyssey. Read one chapter. Okay, the first week, Monday through Friday only, one chapter a day, chapters one through five. Take the weekend off, the following Monday, start with six, one day at a time, you get the idea. You've written it down, you've heard me say it, but I got you got to let it sink in. You do this exactly the way you did the Odyssey. The first month, you read it a chapter at a time, only reading Mondays through Fridays. Okay, second month, you've set it aside. You just set it aside and forget about it. The third month... Pick it up, read it at your own pace, your own leisure, your own pace. And then you're done with the reading. After that, depending upon the individual, the magic will emerge. You will, at some point after that, you will start looking at your own life from the perspective of the Odyssey. You'll begin to recognize uh, conflicts, struggles, obstacles, um, triumphs, successes in your own life within a context of Odysseus and the Odyssey. I think that the Iliad represents bigger things external. Um, if you're somebody who's been in the military and been to war, combat zones, you'll recognize um, various experiences of the Iliad's characters, um, you'll see those emerge in your own experiences. Now, as I said, um, what I think about the Iliad is that it's this story, this myth we're told, in my case, churchianity, you know, in which we're, we, you know, God and the devil, good and evil, you know, they're at, at war and we have to be dragged into the middle of it. You know, we have to kiss the Yahweh's ass and that, or the Agamemnon's ass. Well, I equate Agamemnon with Yahweh and all that, but that's my personal take um, on that. Now, here's an interesting thing. Um, when I was in the, the middle of, uh, it's, oh, by the way, yeah, this is going to take you, what, six to eight months, I think, to read these books the way I've instructed you to. It's, it's a commitment. Okay, and and you know, do it the right way. If you want to get something out of it, do it do it the way it's instructed. You know, don't don't be like um, Alexander David Neal says in Magic and Mystery in Tibet. Don't take the quick path, the what's called the black path of magic, just to get your quick results. Um, I know there's going to be Dunning Kruger cocksure idiots out there that they know more than everybody. They're the smartest guy in the room, and you know, whatever. Okay, do it your way. Um, I'm just saying this is the way I was taught. Um, you guys have heard me talk about weird experiences that I've had, particularly in my book, um, uh, Confessions of a Spooky Mind. Um, some of my synchronicity uh, occurrences that I experienced um, involve the Iliad, specifically, you know, the, the Siege of Troy. Um, so my mentor, again, um, is the one who instructed me to read these books, and then I would understand things, you know, going on. Um, one of the things, uh, because we dealt in, in some cases, classified information, you know, or stuff that should be held close to vest, um, I, he told me, 
he had told me prior, he goes, you will someday figure out how to communicate with me when, when we can't be talking face to face. Like if you have to write me now, remember this was in the nineties, this was before everyone was using the internet and stuff and there were no phones for texting. So you actually had to write real letters. Imagine that. And he told me, he says, you will figure out how to ask me things um, in a way that um, I can answer you so that you'll understand, you'll be able to decipher or decode, you know. Um, so what I did was I remember I wrote him a letter um, asking him questions pertinent to me, but I put it within the context of the Odyssey, okay? For instance, um, uh, one of the questions I asked was, uh, where is the land of the dead or my land of the dead is what I asked. And his answer was one word, Portugal. Now he answered this in 91 or 92 is when I wrote this and I got this answer back, Portugal. Now in 99 is when he told me that, you know, my real grandfather was not the man I was named after. And he gave me the name of the guy who was, according to him, my real grandfather. And over the years I did research and I found out that the spelling of this guy's name was a Portuguese spelling. So, you know, allegedly my real grandfather on my dad's side was this Portuguese guy. And I thought, hmm, he told me land of the dead, my land of the dead was in Portugal. So then after when I had my DNA done for myself, by the way, the U.S. government has had my DNA since 93, okay? When I went in the Air Force, they had started doing DNA, not just, you know. So I figured if Uncle Sam already knew my DNA, I should know it. So uh, I'm, you know, I, I get comments like, oh, how could you give them your DNA? Well, I wanted to know what was in there. And uh, my DNA bears out having a Portuguese grandparent. So it, it matches what I was told. So now I go back to when I wrote that letter to my mentor after having read these books the way he instructed. And, and it got me rethinking, you know, um, in, in the way he needed me to think. So when I asked him, you know, where's my land of the dead? And he said, Portugal, I understand what he was saying. He was saying that I have an my ancestry, part of my ancestry comes from there, that land of the dead as in dead ancestors, right? Not necessarily just a cave where you can go into Hades. I'm I'm sure Portugal has a a legend about something like that. And I'm not I, I'm open to learning about that if it was a literal cave where you go into Hades, the land of the dead, because I'm nutty stupid that way. Um uh but it, it gave it a context. I understood that what he was communicating to me. I also asked him, where is my Penelope? And he said, um, Dover, England. That one I still haven't figured out. So, um, you know, so that that's just a couple of, of things that um, the reading of these books, the way he instructed me, has led to. Um, yeah, as you might guess, this this conversation and this discussion of these books and this topic could go on a lot longer than I've gone on here. But people have asked me, "What's this way that you were taught to read these books?" And that's it. And I look, I'm not saying that this isn't a way that's, you know, that this is a way that hasn't been taught in schools or something like that. All I'm telling you is that's the way he taught me to read them, and it worked. It, it really, uh, there, there was nothing confusing. When I read, finally read the Iliad, the way he had instructed me, and I had already read the Odyssey under those instructions, nothing about this was confusing or chaotic. I, I mean, every word, it was an easy read. And I thought, I, whatever the heck, I mean, you guys know I had that weird thing happen to me in December 79, where I had that awakening thing. And you know that I've had a lifetime of weird experiences, strange phenomena and stuff like that. Well, um, one of the things was, this was, uh, after I had read the books, um, I, uh, woke up, had several wake ups at, 
between 3 and 3.30 in the morning is when these would happen over the course of a few years. And get this, one of them, I was, was I married yet? or Because I, I lived with my first wife for a year before we got married. Anyway, I was with my first wife and 3 o'clock, somewhere between 3 and 3.30, I just wake up, just wide awake. And I feel compelled to go in the living room and turn the TV on. So I go in, I turn the TV on and the channel that it's on there's an old episode of the series, The Time Tunnel. Those of you who have been here for a while, think about that. I've already had my suspicions about my experiences with time phenomena, you know, at that point in my life. And here's a weird wake up. I'm compelled to wake up, you know, at the three o'clock hour, compelled to go turn the TV on. And when I turn it on, what's there but the show, The Time Tunnel? Think that was a foot stomper? Maybe a clue? I don't know. You, you know, decide. Um, and the episode, get this, the episode is one where um, it mixes the Battle of Jericho with the Siege of Troy. Now, remember the time tunnel, the two time travelers caught in time, right? Because they went through the tunnel. Um, they hop around. They can't get back like Odysseus. They can't get back home to our modern times where the time tunnel lab is. They're out there adrift like Odysseus, first of all. Okay, but each episode, there would be two different time periods that they would visit because in trying to leave the one to get back home, they would end up in the next one, right? So they start out, I believe they start out at the Siege of Troy, okay? They arrive there and there's Agamemnon and, and Odysseus. And I forget the specifics of the drama within the context of the time travel story, but there it is, the siege of Troy. And then when they try to leave Troy, they end up in Jericho, where there's also a siege going on. Okay. And there's Rahab, the spy and all this stuff, blah, blah, blah. Now here's what's interesting. What's my takeaway from that? Well, there's an example of equating the siege of Troy with a biblical event, okay? You know, equating the siege of Troy with bringing the walls of Jericho down. Now, go back to the context that I put Agamemnon in, that I suspect Agamemnon is Yahweh, the narcissistic asshole warlord Yahweh, right? Bullying everybody into his battle and fight. Now, when you look at back then in the biblical days, right? When the Israelites, the, the Hebrews, the, uh, were, you know, marching all over and being ordered, you know, hey, uh, Yahweh's telling them, I want you to have their real estate. Go destroy them. Kill every man, woman, and child, okay? For his wrath uh, it, or because they're his preference. Now, we're taught in churchianity that, oh, the good Lord brought down the walls of Jericho, and it's such a glorious, great thing. Well, what if it's not? What if it was just a bunch of guys duped by an asshole to go siege someone else's city? You know, so really the Battle of Jericho has that kind of similarity to the siege of Troy. So there was my first lesson in, oh, there's something going on. So then I bring this up to my mentor and he says, yeah, um, uh, what happens in the Iliad is actually the same thing as what happens with uh, Babel, the Tower of Babel. And that, that puts another spin. I'm like, I still haven't made that connection. I mean, years later, I still, I still haven't clearly seen or deciphered how the Siege of Troy equates to the, the Tower of Babel story, but he said it did. What I see definitely is how it relates to the Siege of Jericho. An army raised, believing in this warlord, you know, equate Yahweh with Agamemnon, and you essentially get the same thing. Um, was it right for them to go destroy Jericho? I don't know. I question that. Okay. Um, so, uh, you know, but, but this, is, this is the kind, one of just one glimpse of an understanding about other mythologies or historical events or, or those things that are in between both um, from a Homeric perspective after having read these books simply in a simple, you know, uh, particular way that a mentor, a teacher taught me to. 
but it and I've just scratched the surface on what I'm talking about here. Okay, and this is something that th this it will emerge for the rest of your life. Okay, um, there's something about these stories that um, it's it's archetypal and and um, it's kind of like it unlocks locks in your psyche. You like like my uncle told me, I would understand certain historical events and certain uh, events in my own life much better if I read these books and read them in the particular way that he suggested. So I guess that particular way it helps absorb it deeply and you know, you go paste so that it's doing its job on your psyche um, with time and with experience. Um, so this is not, I'm not done talking about these books. This is, you know, only the first episode I'm going to be doing on these. But people have asked me, Walter, Walter, what's that way? And and um, I wanted to share that. I wanted to share some of the context of the things I love about these books and, um, you know, what I think they mean. I still don't have all the answers. Um so there we go. It's been, my God, an hour and 45 minutes. You guys know when I get rolling on something and I go this long. So um, I'm going to um, open up, go to the live chat, and uh, open up to questions and comments. So feel free to remember. Ask your question, make your comment in all caps. Um, remember, too, I'm always told to remind you guys of this. The Super Chats are active. You can you can buy me a coffee, buy me a tea, buy me a curry, as uh, the Australian uh, model maker Harry Houdini likes to say on his channel, Houdini Models. Um, you know, but uh, here we have our first comment. ModWiz125. I think the various chariots in these books is tech akin to what Nimza was using. Vimana tech derivative. Oh, I like that mod whiz. I like that. That brings in the Vedic. Yes. The Vedic has, you know, I, you know what? I'm going to have to study Mahabharata to see <coughs> possibly more Vedic um, uh, resonance with this. That Thank you. That's great. Crying out loud. This, yes, as Johnny Side says, all questions in caps. Okay. RE, let me make sure I didn't miss one. Tim Houston, thanks for sharing that reading method, Walter. You're welcome, Tim. Uh, give it a try and do it honestly, and I think you'll you'll get some pretty noticeable results. Ari Bavel asks, do you find a Hecate connection in Homer's with Homer's work? She predates Homer by about 800 years. I think. Well, yeah, Ari, anytime you see Pallas Athena, there's Hecate. And look how many times Persephone is mentioned, you know, connected with the underworld stuff. The Hecate right there. But yeah, anytime you, um, uh, in fact, I'm surprised Hecate wasn't more directly represented in the land of the dead chapter, but anytime you find, um, Pallas Athena, Athena, you, there's the aspect of Hecate right there being represented. Philip Blair, Dover, England makes me think closest point to France from England. Could this be relevant? Thank you, Philip. Um, maybe it, yes, it actually could. My mother's family, her father's family, ancestors, the Corbins. That's how we pronounce it here. That's how it became pronounced um, eventually, you know, by the Scottish ancestors. Uh, they started in France. So the proper pronunciation is Corban. Um, and uh, interestingly enough, according to the records, 
um, my mom's Corbin ancestors left France, gee, uh, during the same year and time period, the year that um, the Templars were being persecuted and many of them had to flee France. And guess where my mom's ancestors landed? Uh, they landed in Scotland in the very village, a couple of villages where the Templars were known to go. So there is some time. Now remember, Templar knights had a huge retinue, right? They had a, a support staff. So ancestors could just as easily have been the, the, the farmer who, you know, worked for the knight and was loyal to him. Could have been the, the carpenter that worked for the knight and was loyal to him. And, and you get the idea, you know. Um, but um, because of that connection to France through my mother's side, uh, yeah, I've, I've not looked at that particular question from that perspective. Um, but thank you for that suggestion, Philip Blair. I will look at that now. Splash says, excellent stream, Walter. Thank you. We definitely want a part two and three soon. Well, I yeah, that will happen. That will happen. Thank you, Splash. Ryan Perella, tell me more of Hecate. Is she consort to Hermes? Hecate is consort to no one. I know there's some versions out there. There's some modern interpretations. Hecate, like Athena, doesn't get it on with anyone. Okay? Um, they have bigger fish to fry than, than those kinds of desires. Damn it, with the screen jumping crap. Oh, Ryan Prella, thank you. Uh, thank you, Ryan. You're welcome. Uh, am I Welsh at all? I, I, don't, I don't know. Um, uh, there's apparently no English in me, um, but uh, I'm 70% Scots-Irish. Um, and uh, the rest is the... The other stuff, but I'm not aware of any Welsh anyway. Todor Kolev. Hi, Walter. Is it kind of gangsta power dynamics playing between the Greek Asians? Um, yeah, you could say, I guess, right? I mean, Agamemnon, you know, is certainly like the mob boss, you know, who's an asshole. So, you know. You could say that. Now, look, I have no doubt that there's a bunch of you, some of you in the audience watching this, who who are uh, who are may, certainly better versed at this literature than I am and other related esoteric and occult topics. So you could probably enlighten me on certain things that maybe I'm overlooking. But uh, Philip Blair, no. Athena... When you really dig into it, if you hear a version that Athena had some guy or consort, no. Athena was uh, mostly known as a virgin goddess. Um, you know, uh, no. Athena did not have consorts. I, I, it's a peeve of mine because, you know, we live in an era when, um, look at Halloween costumes. You know, we have, um, you know, everything has to be, uh, pardon me for using this term, but uh, there's no other term to use it. You know, we have, you know, bimbo or slutty nurse, bimbo or slutty uh, nun, you know, everything's got to be sexified, all these figures. And I see that, you know, that some subcultures and groups like to do that with all the gods and goddesses. You know, yeah, Aphrodite was a horn dog. Um and others, but um, not all of them. And when I see like the sexy Hecate, I just laugh, you know, and the sexy Athena, I, I just laugh because, you know. Ryan Prella asks, who is the male analog to Hecate? I'm not aware of one. She's one of the Chthonics and they're originals. And so I do not think that there's an actual male analog to Hecate. Now, Somebody probably in the witch culture, you know, um, in our times is going to say they know, 
and that it's blah, blah, blah. But I would look to the older sources. And then when you look at older sources, you're going to find conflict there too. So you kind of have to, through your own study and experience, you have to ultimately decide where you land on these things. So originals, yes. So I hope that that the method is not disappointing to hear. Um, it really is that that simple, but it's what it does to your understanding. It's what it does to your psyche that is what that is what matters. Okay. Modwiz125, if there must be war, it is best that it is administered by wisdom or Athena. Absolutely. You don't want Ares as your, you know, divine guide into war because it'll just never end. War, 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 because, you know, the bloodlust. Uh, Athena is who you want as a guide in that instance if you, if you got to have one. Slick dissident, male analog to Hecate's Apollo. Eh, eh, I don't know about that, but that's okay. Ryan Perella, wait a minute, hold on, hold on. Slick dissident, is Apollo one of the Chthonic gods? Because Hecate is, Hecate predates Apollo. Um, Anyway, Ryan Perella, Walter, have you ever seen the HBO show Raised by Wolves, produced by Ridley Scott? No, I have not. Tim Houston, Athena will not be crying over anything. That's right. Chthonic delight. That's not, there's no A in there. Um, it's C H T H O N I C, Chthonic. Well, thank you, Joey Charlie. I appreciate it. What the heck? Oh, my God. Okay. Jan 108. Thanks for the method, Walter. Going to start April 1st. What translation? The WHD Rouse. Look for these. These are really nice additions. God, I, I mean, you know me. I'm a small, I'm a publisher. So I love, you know, I love the, the cover art here. On, on these, but this is the WHD, that's three initials, WHD, Rouse, R-O-U-S-E. And these are at Barnes and Noble, and uh, that's the one I use. Now, now, I've, um, I do have this in verse, but I've had, I've done most of my study with these Rouse prose style ones. I'm going to, uh, I'll tell you right now, uh, I'm going to go back and redo the readings of these as instructed by my mentor, but I'm going to do it um, with the verse versions. Okay. And we'll see, you know, it'll be like, you know, later this year, see if I get, you know, any kind of uh, strong results. So, but, but yeah, um, Jan 108, it's the WHD Rouse. And I will, Okay, so <sighs> Ryan Prella, Apollo and Artemis are a dyad. They exist together, I believe. Yeah, Apollo and Artemis have the connection. D. Dorothy Papineau, I must get a copy of the Odyssey. Yes, you must get get this one. It's nice. Yes. Mod Wiz 125 understands it. Hecate stands alone. Sovereign Shakti power. Hecate indeed stands alone. Philip Blair, have you looked to see how the Odyssey connects to the major epics of Ireland? Not yet, but... Um, Ireland is one of the places that I told you a scholar has um, tried to map out the journey of Odysseus, and uh, Ireland is definitely part of it. Hey, it's interesting that 
part of the army of Agamemnon and in the 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 seizure the besiegers of Troy are called the Danaans, D A N A A N, right? Like the Tuatha Dé Danann. Now we know there were the Mediterranean uh, tribal Danaans. Okay, so this is a reference to their ancient, you know, um, an- their ancestors and such. So um, they had some type of cultural connection to the Tuatha, in my opinion. And the opinion of others, too. Killendale says, the Irish are not a fan of the word Celtics. Maybe because they're Lakers fans. (laughs) Oh, I couldn't resist that. My umbrella says, bingo. Uh, Wait a minute. Good God, this stuff skips and jumps on me. Marcos Toledo, I had the Rouse translations, but I lost them and I got an 1897 and finally read that translation. Oh, that's cool, Marcos. That's very cool. Splash asks, could we get a Hecate show, Walter? Absolutely. I think I've done one, but maybe not. Um... Oh, wow. I'm at the two-hour point. Um, so, okay, folks, I am at the two-hour point, and um, I think that's enough of me for anybody. I want to thank everybody in the live chat for all your questions and comments, and thank everybody viewing. We had a decent turnout. Um And again, I hope it didn't disappoint. I'm going to be real anxious later this year to start hearing, um, you know, how some of you fare with the uh, reading um, the Iliad and the Odyssey. Oops. The Iliad and the Odyssey. Okay. And, um, you know, if you encounter any of the um, phenomena associated with um, unlocking these keys in your psyche, uh, it. Uh, it should be a very interesting experience. Slick Dissident says, Carla UNESCO is Hecate expert. You should have her on. Okay, is she an expert from the witchcraft perspective? Because um, no disrespect intended to witches, um, but uh, their their perspective on Hecate is but a slice of Hecate, is not the complete Hecate, even though they're, they some of them can be very Dunning-Kruger about it. Um, it's still not the comprehensive Hecate from the witch perspective. So um, I'm just saying you got to kind of understand that, Um, you know. Thank you, Todor. Thank you, Philip. Okay, Carla Unesco. Okay, cool. Cool. Uh, Tim Houston says, Walter, not true. Tim, what's not true? I'm curious. I mean, what did I say that um, was the not true part? Not a debate. I, I'm honestly, um, Alexandria, okay. Uh, Give me more, Alexandria here. Give me more, Tim. I'm not. Oh, yeah. Well, no, they do. They do. But um, it's not. The, the witchcraft culture experience with Hecate is not the complete answer. It's not the complete description. In fact, um, everything there is to know about Hecate is not gleaned through the strict uh, witchcraft. Oh, Alexandrian witchcraft. Oh, okay. That that's the tradition you come to. Um, okay. Okay. So you get, but you get what I'm saying, right? Is that she's she's not just um, what 
a lot of folks think she's just the spooky, you know, the sexy spooky um, lady fiend of the underworld. <laughs> There's you, you get where I'm coming from. I know you do. Okay, cool. I will contact. Um, I'll try to get in touch with Dr. Ionescu because um, it's a fascinating subject. So, okay, folks, again, I want to thank you all. Um, and uh, you have a good evening. And, uh, you know, Malia and I will see you on Saturday. So thanks again, folks, and have a good night.